Chair Leggett, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, right now it's 106 p.m. Um, we ran a little behind my call. And uh, it is, uh, this is the service delivery um, operational committee. And uh, today is Tuesday, May the 9th, uh, 2023. So uh, we would like to go ahead and get started. Our agenda is what follows. Uh, this is our call to order. And next we have our proposed board agenda, uh, consent items by committee so as Yes. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Okay. All right. So, um, good afternoon, um, board members, colleagues, and everybody watching this outside this um, room. I am happy to um, share with the committee of our any updates of our preaching department. So I'm going to start first with the safety security management. Um, this is, am I on the right track? We uh, have to go through the, um, the agenda items. Oh, the agenda items, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was off track. So we start with the agenda items, which is going to be this way. Yeah. There's the last one. Okay. So on the agenda items, we have um, the disposal of our very classes. And then um, the next one is going to be the hurricane preparedness plan uh, revision, and then the CDL specialization training. And so let's see. Am I doing this right? I hope I'm doing this right. Recommending board approval for the disposal of assets that include five air transit revenue vehicles, two fixed route revenue units, and six non revenue support vehicles and small support units. Um, we currently have seven revenue vehicles that have exceeded their useful life, and that useful life is defined by FCA as a minimum acceptable period of a capital request asset that's purchased with FCA funds and how they uh, it should be. Uh, the pair of transit revenue units that were placed in service that we mentioned earlier uh, between were placed in service between 2018 and 2023 and have exceeded their useful life um, at, of at least 100,000 miles. Uh, the fixed route revenue units were placed in service between 2009 and 2023 and have exceeded their useful life of 12 years and or 500,000 uh, vehicle miles. The non-revenue support vehicles placed in service between 2007 and 2023 and they exceeded their useful life of four years or 100,000 miles. And the forklift was purchased in 1995 and it says it has exceeded its useful life of five years. I would say it well exceeded its useful life mm -hmm. of five years and we have a, um, I know a very happy assistant COO of maintenance um, that is looking at a, a, a new forklift to to perform the tasks that are needed. All assets covered under this are fully depreciated and have a book value of zero. So disposal of these assets will allow staff to maintain a fleet safe and reliable working vehicles and operating equipment consistent with FCA guidelines. Staff will dispose of these assets through either auctioning to the highest bidder, disposal through donation to any nonprofit interested in the use of the asset, or disposal of scrap to recover scrap metal. Are there any questions on that particular item at this point? Again, this is disposal of, of assets. Five paratransit revenue vehicles, two fixed route revenue units, and six non-revenue support vehicles due to leave the forklift. The Madam CEO. Yes, sir. Are we uh, disposing 
uh, via outside company for the uh, for auction, or are we doing an in-house auction? Yeah. Um. So we have a guideline of how to dispose it, right? So we well, we're gonna follow the procedure of of the, how we dispose our vehicles. Normally, it's either for donation, um, which is, they have to request that. Uh, it's a process that is set up on online on our website of how to follow the process. So we will let the public know of um, how to go by the process. And I'm new in this, so I hope I hope that's the right thing to say. Yeah, Dr. Manny, I was I was asking because uh, the question was raised before uh, anyone that's affiliated with the organization. Uh, if they have a nonprofit, or they put their uh, their bid in to um, to purchase or to have something donated to them, is it uh, unethical for any anybody that's affiliated either with the board or with the organization as a whole to put their bid in for something like that? around affiliations with um, nonprofits that might be interested in one of these vehicles and also the exact process that we'll utilize for that um, opportunity. Is that, is that um, all right, sir? Yes, ma'am. I, I just wanted to make sure we stayed uh, above board because uh, a lot of people are asking questions as far as uh, purchasing, um, who uh, get uh, grants or what have you, and especially being that, you know, open records and now at the forefront of a lot of people's conversations and we want to make sure that we do everything right. Director Leggett, I think Director Lockett is requesting to be uh, recognized. I don't know if you can see my hand or not, can you? No, sir. <laughs> I got you, go ahead. And I, th I thought his question was more if a and I director like I may have misunderstood. I thought his question was is if a nonprofit, if any of our board members have an affiliation with a nonprofit and that nonprofit is also interested, is there any issue there? And I don't think there is as long as to your point, as long as it's going through the nonprofit. But I want to go back and let us just verify that and also verify the exact process that will be used and who will be conducting it so that you all know, because I'm sure that there are many nonprofits in the community that will be interested and that you all do have um, associations and so forth with that you want to make aware of this opportunity. Yes, ma'am. I think uh, Director uh, Lockett and I are on the same page. Very good. The next item under uh, consent items is the hurricane preparedness uh, plan. This is the, our, it was last reviewed, um, you know, we do this annually, last reviewed in April of 2022. We always do this in close coordination with SEMA and our other partners in the community. Uh, the current version of the plan required updates to reflect changes in personnel. And we also made just some modest changes that um, positively impacted the clarity and readability um, of the plan um, so that it continues to improve. Um, are there any particular questions or comments about the hurricane preparedness plan? So we're gonna still go with the same plan that we've been uh, going with for the past couple of years, right? We just tweaked it a little bit. We just tweaked it a little bit, sir. And again, it's in complete um, collaboration with our partners at SEMA and others in the community that we, um, we obviously, when we activate around these kinds of events, we activate um, under their leadership and in complete cooperation with the county and others. The hurricane is uh, pushed up a month or two. Um, are we looking at that same uh, timeline? I'm sorry, sir, could you repeat that question? Uh, now that hurricane season is pushed up a month or two, are we working on that same timeline? We are, sir. Yeah, and if I may add this on, so we met with SEMA two days ago. As my father, we're kind enough to um, accept my invitation to come on site. I will met with the comms team. 
uh, maintenance and myself and also safety. And um, we requested them to come on and give us on-site drill um, in case they haven't done that since I've been here. And so they were happy to um, um, accept that recommendation and they'll get back to us as to when they will be on site to give us a drill training in case of any hurricane happens, what, what we have to do and what to go and all that stuff. So I will let the board know when that is scheduled. The, the, the last item um, on consent is the CDL specialized training program. And I know uh, that Dr. Manny is going to want to talk about this in detail, yeah. but an overview is that we are seeking to launch a training program for new fixed route operators with no commercial driver's license to obtain a license. Again, this is a part of our being more competitive about getting our uh, operator um, power up. Um, our, our levels of hiring up. Uh, the purpose of the proposed training program is increased staffing and then to improve the quality and preparedness of new fixed route operators. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Maney to talk more about this program. Thank you, Ms. Fay. Um, as you all know, this has been um, one of my projects since I've um, I joined CAT. Um, operator shortage is all nationwide, and the only way that we can have manpower, in my opinion, is to also have a uh, CDA training on site where we're going to have to recruit people to come in. We're going to train them up to uh, eight weeks. And after eight weeks, they'll get their license. What I also intend to do is I'm um, trying to have our safety officer and do all the uh, coursework to become a tester. A tester will be on site. So after the training, instead of us going to a vendor and um, uh, ask the vendor to test them, in some cases, if the vendor is booked up, they would still be sitting and waiting to, to get a slot. And that is still on a payroll. So if we're able to get our own tester, right after training, um, the safety officer, Samuel Kennedy, will have them on the road test to test them and, of course, qualify them for CDL. That will speed up the whole process. So um, it's an eight weeks program. We have a legal document attached to this where they will stay with us for one year, at least one year. And um, if they happen to leave um, before the one year, then they have to reimburse us the cost. So the cost, the financial impact, is all attached here. Um, on our research, uh, we call so many vendors in town. And so it's around 4,277 per training. Some other places up to 7,000. But since we're not in for money, and um, we, we take the lowest cost and everything is detailed in here. So it's an eight week program and they will have to stay with us for at least a year after the program. And if they leave, then they will owe us that money, the 4,277. And the, the good news about this is that once they train by CAT standard, uh, they're more obedient to follow our policy because that's all they know. And all this coming from other companies is sometimes a challenge. And they always say, so, oh, well, where, we, where I came from, this and this and this and that. This is new. They never drive a bus. We're going to train them from the ground up. So it's a, it's a very good program. And the financial impact is um, not that great as expected. So that's the direction uh, that we asked the board to approve this. Because it will enhance our manpower shortage. And it will also help us to expand on all the areas that we want to go. And with that, any questions on that? Comment. Sure. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Manny? Yes, sir. Well, thank you for the, uh, for the program itself. It, it addressed so many issues that we have in the community, especially for uh, young people who are trying to get uh, to truck driving classes, knowing that the previous truck driving classes have shut down at Savannah Tech. And uh, for them to have it in this area, and my question was, and you answered it pretty quickly, that uh, is it a contract for them to sign and they had to sign on for a certain amount of time? And uh, is it a, a fee attached? So you answered all those, and I, I, I appreciate you even bringing that to the forefront because I know it was a uh, 
it was a, actually a, a thought Mr. Massimo was talking about bringing everybody and um, bringing all of our drivers up so that we can um, address a lot of our manpower issues. So uh, kudos again to your, you guys on staff for really already for the forethought. You guys are already there. Thank you, Director. Any other questions on this CDL training? Okay, so with that was next on agenda. Okay, all right. So sorry about that. Um, this was my first time, so <laughs> thanks, Ms. Faith, for building me out on that. Um, so now, um, a regular report. I'm gonna start first with the first slide will be about safety. So we don't have much on the safety side report this time because the, um, we just hired a new SMS manager and um, he's trying to put everything together. So the next time we'll have everything detailed. But so far, um, as you can see, I'm more concerned about what is preventable. Accidents that are not preventable, there's not much we can do. But those that are preventable, that's where I am so um, key and I want to do anything to prevent more from happening because if it's preventable, we can, and we should train folks to avoid um, samples of um, preventable accident could be somebody paying a fare and the driver just pull out instead of telling them to sit down and then come and pay when they stop. So uh, these are all a part of things that we can avoid. Uh, I remember years ago when I was driving the bus, we were, we were trained to have a passenger sit down and when you get to a stop, bring them to the fare box and have them pay instead of signing and trying to take off. And this is our liabilities that we can avoid. So there's not much on here. As you can see, uh, fish rod had four and um, some of them were even the mechanics trying to back up on, on our premises, which is something that we, we talked about. We're gonna have all that corrected. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. On the training side, uh, as you all can see, when I came on board, I started this um, aggressive hiring, recruiting on every Friday, walking and uh, seek a job. It's working so far. I think that has been almost about 80% of our recruitment. Every Friday, we're able to get people in. So I'm happy to um, share with the community that this time we have five CDL students in our class. Yeah, which is a very, and they all came with CDL. Oh, we have to train them on, ours, on our routes and they'll be done in five weeks to join our workforce. On the power transit, uh, we had two that are also in training. So um, in five weeks, we're gonna have a staff of seven, five for fixed rod and two for power transit, which is a very, very good thing. And most of all this came through our Friday worked in uh, recruitment, which we started when I came on board. So just so good. And we hope to continue and we hope that um, more people will, will know about this program and worked in every Friday. That's the hope. So um, anybody listening, we hiring, coming here Friday one to four and um, worked in and let us know what you can do and see all our job openings and you can apply. Dr. Manny, before you go to the next slide, one other thing I want to mention here that I think is important for this committee and our directors, board members, and the public to be aware of is um, while this particular slide and the information is really focused on the training that Mr. Swinton, Mr. Swinton is our overall training manager for all of CAT. Um, and in addition to the training that is being discussed here that is really focused on our operators, critical um, part of what we do, um, I will also want to call out some recent, um, uh, very important trainings that that um, that Mr. Swinton is scheduling that are related to all employees. Um, we just recently completed um, an all employee, every employee training on sexual harassment. Um, we also have um, things that benefit employees' um, lives coming up, um, and, and including things like. Um, estate planning and those kinds of things that are just important parts, uh, uh, financial literacy training that are important parts of giving our employees not only all the tools that they need to have 
um, a successful career here, but also we want them to know that we care and we want them to have the tools for successful lives as well. So very important part of, I think, recruitment and retention. Um, and I want to really be sure that we um, call out and give kudos to Mr. Swinton for that comprehensive training piece that he's doing. Thank you. Well, we we are we are we are creating the experience as we go, Director Lockett. We're we're thinking about all the things that we know we need to do to be really comprehensive in our thinking about how to benefit all of CAT and every employee. Um, and Mr. Swinton is rising to the challenge of you know helping to find the ways that we can accomplish that. So very good. Dr. Manny, I want to add one other thing related to that as well. So um, really uh, exciting opportunity is in that SMART grant that we were recently awarded um, that we have 100% um, funding in there for training um, on electric vehicles for both operators and maintenance staff. Again, it's a, our commitment to helping our staff grow their careers and to recruiting um, the talent in that has an interest in growing in that part of the industry in electric vehicles. And we um, we had a meeting earlier this morning with union leadership, Dr. Manny and I did, and we talked about that specifically, and we're going to be collaborating on what that training looks like and um, how we offer it to ensure, that, again, that we are continuing to support career growth and skill development for um, CAT employees. Five minutes, that's fine. You have to be on time to go. So, for example, the class is scheduled to be at 10 o'clock. It has to be there 10 o'clock. Or 10 o'clock. You cannot be there any time before the class. If you run early, you will be late. So, I'm, I'm looking at um, five minutes to the class, 30 minutes. Seven minutes early before the time. That's the side you're going to be running early or the class will be there. So, what I want to do is if you run late, you get five minutes to catch up. So, the national standard is to build five minutes. So, the bus is 30 minutes early.
so our conclusion is this uh, the total estimate is equal to four pi and that means Not one or six, and say that the last one, the last one or six was was one or six. Now this tells us that the part is not complete here at all. All. Okay. So 115, and partly was that um, most of the drivers call out sick. It was spring break; they want to be with their family. It was Easter holiday, so. Again, all this could go away if we're able to have full capacity. That means if we have the manpower and have, currently we have two people on extra board. So if anything, somebody call out sick, two is not enough to cover most of the route. So that's why we have high mystery. As we do, these are all the reason why we should have the CDA training to have our own staff. And the FTA regulation is to have 20% of your drivers on extra board. These are all for the reasons when people call out sick, the routes will be covered. So that's why you see this number very high. Um, it's the holiday, a spring break. We have a lot of high absenteeism. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, this this can uh, this can be fixed if we can um, get the CDA training and get manpower. Everything on here is manpower. Now a mess trip is defined as a bus did not even. If you look on the the mode, it says not run. You see where it says not run, and then it's 115. If you don't have the manpower, the bus don't go out. What we're trying to do to provide services. If you have four blocks on a route and one route has nobody on, we pull one that have more routes to supplement for the other route so we can provide service. This is why we keep, we keep it rolling. But so this is a key that the manpower issue is really critical. Uh, right now, we, we, we short about almost 42 drivers. And, and, and it's, it's gonna be a problem. It's nationwide, but we, we have a plan to have people here recruit them and help them. It's, this will all go away if we have enough manpower. It's all about recruitment. Recruitment, yeah. yeah. Any, any other questions on the ridership? I'm oh, sorry, I'm now on the ridership, on the manpower stuff. So on the ridership, um, despite all what is going on, we're still okay, not as compared to uh, March, but it was very close. Um, had a negative of 2.6, um, lower than last month. We had 152,123 ridership. Uh, all that again, like I said, we can do more with, with more people, um, staff. So, okay, next slide, please. Now, this is about paratransit, and um, I apologize to the committee that this wasn't addressed early on. Uh, on the mess trip side, if you see, if you compare that to last month, look at the difference, 236 mess trips on the a, on a paratransit side, and then look at this minus four. That's a big difference. The question is why? Why that difference? And it, it, it's so strange that I, I got involved and we called FTA and um, the FTA defined what is a mixed trip. So in the past, they were, they were calculating unscheduled trips with mixed trip. That's why the number was high. A mixed trip is when we say we're gonna pick you up, you had reservations. So the paratransit system is set up that you call in and make a reservation for the next day. And the next day, if we don't show up within that 30, 
minutes window, then we miss that trip. So this is why now we got it corrected. We had um, a memo attached. This is direct from the FTA how to calculate the missed trip. So moving forward, you're all gonna see the missed trip on Empire Transit side very low. Yeah, we're going to say, so we're, we're combining unscheduled trip and, and naming as missed trip, which is not, unscheduled is you want to stand by. So even though you have reservation, just like you're traveling to the, I mean, on, at the airport and says you have to be a standby. If somebody cancel, then you have a seat. So that is unscheduled. But we're combining all that and FTA says, no, we can't do that. As much as kudos to Tia, Tia um, Baker had that, conversation with FTA um, agent and explain it what the power transit mistrip is defined. So there's a difference between unscheduled and pretty much unscheduled is you on a standby. till so somebody cancel and then we can give you a spot. But the mistrip is that you have reservation for us to pick you up. And the fourth in question here is, is, is an error. In, somebody took the booking and the time was wrong and two of them will show up late and the, and the people says well we've been waiting too long we don't need you anymore that's why we have four so um i want you all to pay attention to this as we move on in our reporting i want i want us to be on point and get everything corrected so uh, it will be good information for the public and also for for the board and our staff uh, next slide please Now, the still on the paratransit side, this is also uh, uh, another error. If you see the operator coaching, uh, this is what happened. We had two in training. One came on the first day onboarding, got sick, and didn't show up three days. So when it came to me, I'm like, let's call her and see if she's coming or, or whatever the condition is. And she said she was out sick. So uh, the good news is that she came back and joined us. She's in training. So that number changed to two instead of one yeah. any questions on that okay next slide please on the marine side i will speak a little bit and i have miss faith have an input um ridership on the marine is is always high there's a demand for it um we're running on two um ferries and occasionally the out of service and we use the bus bridge so i'll let miss Faye uh, talk a little bit about that. So marine operations um, is um, as visible as any part of our um, operations um, and one that, of course that the that the visiting public also engages with frequently so it has such high visibility in a number of different um, places and in a number of different ways. The unreliability of the service right now in spite of the very best efforts certainly absolutely no reflection on um, our marine services um, marine operations folks um, but the reliability of the service is just um, it's it's an every week kind of thing um, dr manny can tell you that we spent a good portion of this past weekend saturday and sunday dealing with the fact that no vehicle no ferries were operational um, one of them had just had a repair and, and there was still some other issue, but the other, um, we have pictures of what all uh, folks had dumped in the river and we pulled out of the engine because it, it, uh, it clogged the engine up, clogged the, um, the system up and, and caused it to break down. So we just have, and the good news is that the new hybrid vehicles actually have a, that are on order, actually have a component to them that prevents that from happening. Um, but in the meantime, for the next 16 months or so, we, we just know that we're going to be managing a situation of unreliability. Um, we are, we work, so what is that really about? Everything becomes about communication. So we communicate very directly and quickly with our partners. Um, we also, our comm staff stays on top of the service alerts that have to go out for anyone who's subscribed to those so that there's knowledge there. We've also um, developed and are putting in place and have ready to put in place immediately new signage when these kinds of events occur so that whoever's trying to travel, especially with a lot of folks in town for things like ACCG and so forth, um, and there's so many events just like that, 
um, that they have immediate visual information if, for, if they happen to not be subscribed to our um, alert system. So we're, we're, we're certainly working the communication side diligently and I wanted to mention in that regard um, we are reaching out through um, our current contracts that we have that include what I think in the past might have been referred to as more crisis communications, but it's not typically what you would have been used to. But uh, we want to develop an external module that can be utilized by um, our comm staff over the next 16 months so that we're getting ahead of these unreliability issues and we're positioning this in the most positive way, acknowledging that that situation exists making sure that we're promoting what is coming in terms of improvements, making sure that we're promoting that if our ferries do happen to be down and you're not able to take those, guess what? We have a great bus bridge. You get to be a part of our surface transportation fleet um, and so forth. So we're going we're gonna to be working um, with some, some outside support to develop that module of, of communication that then we can continue to regularly dis deploy over the next 16 months to stay ahead of this. I think that's really important from a brand impact perspective. And then lastly, um, related to all this as well, uh, you know, we had a grant, remember one of the grants that was in danger of, of a lapse uh, that we are, we are so close to um, a final um, FTA approval and release of funds. It's, we're just, we're, it's very much small little matters right now of, of you know, just, just sort of um, check, check the box type requirements, nothing of, of substance that remains to be done, but just small things that we have to be sure that we're completely responsive to in the FTA regulatory world. So we are, we are hopeful that very soon we'll have a release of those funds and we are ready to go on putting both the uh, new dock on the west side and the ferry maintenance facility, which is the most important part of that, in my opinion, the ferry maintenance facility out to bid and get those, um, those very important pieces of infrastructure um, in service. Just wanted to add that to that uh, report. It is tremendous high, especially once they finish the uh, building over there on the west side. Yes, sir. I think the other thing, Director Lockett, that you'll see is when you see the master transit plan, there's also exploration of what not only what's happening right now, but what that means for our service in the future. Um, and all of these things are just going to be essential to our continued growth. So we got to be ready. We have to be ready. And on the Marine side, I just want to um, give a shout out to um, our manager of the Marine Service, uh, John Allen. He's been an awesome guy. Um, if you just talk about debris that was um, around the propeller, so the ferry couldn't even move. Uh, he dived into the river and pretty much physically took out all the debris. And so, John, if you're listening, kudos to you and your team. Proud of you. Next slide, please. Now, this slide, if you all want to pay good attention on this. So this was a recommendation. If you all can see, we changed the format of how we report this. This is the, um, the, um, the mean distance. So if you see mean distance between vehicle fields, that means how long can our, our buses run before they break down. And in the past, we just put all the numbers together and report it at one. If you all can recall last month, um, Director Clinton suggested that we break it down so everybody will understand where is the problem, which one is not functioning right. And so this is the breakdown. And this is, I mean, I, I like that idea. Brilliant. So on this, you can see fixed route, non EV, meaning they're not electric vehicles, they're either diesel or, or hybrid. And from that, we have 11,201 miles before the breakdown. That is not even near the uh, average national standard. The national standard says at least 14,000. And if you look at the electric vehicle, it went even over the national average. So that means the electric vehicles are functioning right. They can go 17,771. The national average is 14,000 before any breakdown. And uh, if you look at road calls today, on the fixed route side, non EV, we have 10 breakdowns. And out of service, we had 11. 
and look at it on the same table on the electric vehicle, it's all zero. So I guess the future is all electric. Um, I, I can support that. Uh, our vehicles are over useful life, over age, and the mechanics are trying everything to, um, to keep it up. Um, and on my next slide, I'm gonna talk about what we have in plan for the fixed route and to get the buses all kind of up to date and at least run for another seven, six to seven years. Uh, on the power transit side, similar problem we have, they all non-electric, non uh, six of them are out of service as we, we're waiting for engine transmission. So this is all gonna change because we have 10 electric vehicles on site. And um, as soon as the charging stations are um, implemented, or install, we're gonna have them all roll out on revenue line. Um, Ms. Faye, you want anything to say on that? Um, I just wanted to add uh, back to the comments you were making earlier on the electric vehicles, Dr. Manny. One of the things that um, directors you will, and, and chairman that you will see um, in our board, our upcoming budget workshop in my, in the, the uh, CEO's cover letter to the budget is a, is a um, an aim or a vision that um, over half of our fleet would be electric by 2035. Um, I think, as Dr. Manny says, I certainly think that is part of the future. But what is going to be really important to that is not that we just that we have electric vehicles, but that we have strong community partnerships for charging infrastructure. So this past week, we've reached out to uh, the county, the city, um, the um, economic development community the business community and uh, to um, Georgia Power. And we are uh, assembling a group that is gonna be discussing how we can leverage the resources that we all bring to bear in the charging infrastructure space for Chatham County um, and the region. Um, so that we make sure that as we're bringing these vehicles online, that, um, that they have ample charging infrastructure available throughout the community so that they can run efficiently and effectively. And we're gonna do that as a strong partnership together and um, actually thinking about that as we look towards the 2024 legislative. Um, I think I mentioned at the last meeting, we're already developing our agenda for that next legislative session and that's gonna be a key part of it. So, but I was excited that all of our partners were as um, um, you know, prioritize this kind of an effort as much as we do. And so um, stay tuned and look for good things to come there. Thank you, Mr. Mar hmm. Uh I don't see anything for old and new business, uh, Dr. Manny, under uh, uh, number four. Uh, uh, director, I had one thing I wanted to mention under old and new business since it's okay. not directly on this committee's agenda, but it's one that you're going to be hearing about in other committees and I wanted to be sure we were bringing awareness to it. So you may recall at the last meeting that we in, uh, indicated and, and you've also seen it in the various snapshot um, uh, snapshots over the last few weeks that we had undertaken a bit ago, we had undertaken a compl comprehensive review of all um, active contracts at CAT. We put a particular emphasis on those that were awarded prior to March of 2022. The more current ones, of course, you've seen very recently and we have awareness around those as well. But we made sure to do a really thorough scrub of all contracts that are currently um, uh, on CAT's books, so to speak. You are gonna be seeing a report on that. Um, and you're also going to see um, operations and management actions that I'm going to be moving forward with related to that and um, how we're going to be um, some of those, for example, we're going to we're going to decide not to continue with um, that may be active right now. Um, and we're going to move to a different model um, uh, of and one of those, for example, um, could be around security services for the building. I think we want to go to a more of a self security, self supplied security model. Um, because um, security is so important around every public facility right now. I mean, we see um, all the things that happen across the country and um, it's just really important that we are keeping our passengers and, and our employees extremely safe. Um, so we're gonna look at some differences there that we think will yield a better performance. 
Um, we're going to be looking at um, some changes around how we look at government affairs. We're going to be looking, there's several. So those are just some examples of how we're going to move those forward. And I just wanted to be sure that um, in the interest of transparency and um, all the different committees, the other committees may be getting some more detailed reports on that, but I wanted to be sure we were calling that out to this committee as well. So thank you very much, Director. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, is that all for old and new business? We can move forward to uh, uh, item number five, if there's anything. So item number five is just proposed business actions that are gonna be um, in other committees. Again, this is a part of being transparent and making sure that you're also seeing what's happening other places. So in the in the financial services and audit compliance committee, you, you see uh, six different um, uh, business for action items there. The Savannah Riverboat Contract Agreement. This is an agreement by the, that's been underway for a bit. It's just to govern the use of if the Savannah Riverboat ever needed to use our dock. That Of course, that we know that that dock and ramp is currently not there because of the seawall collapse, but nonetheless, if they do need to use it, as was um, a, a request from them prior to that seawall collapse, we needed to have an agreement in place that talked about their compensation for doing so, their assumption of liability, their you know insurance and those kinds of things. So um, this agreement just covers that, and it's a more of a moving forward, uh, making sure we're addressing that for the future. The Georgia Power Paratransit um, Infrastructure Charging Infrastructure uh, Remix Planning Software. Um, this is something that we have funded through the um, MPO and MPC. Um, and it's a it's a really important part of our uh, planning tools, um, especially for forecasting um, equity impacts. Florence Martis uh, Ferry Repair. We stated earlier the unreliability of our fleet right now, and there's expect to see this and more ferry repairs um, moving forward over the next 16 months. Really important that we keep our fleet moving for those 16 months. Um, but I know we're all going to be delighted when we finally see um, those new ferries out there in the water. Uh, the GDOT um, uh, revised grant application, this was sent to you um, uh, as for information in uh, last week's snapshot. We, um, great news, it was a good reason for this. We had originally um, made that submission and thought that our award, our original award amount was around $260,000, $270,000. And we were informed that our award had increased to $790,000. So uh, that is uh, ratifying that revised grant application to receive increased funds is always a, a good message, a welcome problem to have, I suppose. And then the last is our FY 2024 Health Insurance Renewal Contract Award. We'll, you'll have a report from the broker on that. I will tell you that one of the things that you're going to see that was a major impact in our budget this year um, and the budget work that we've been doing is the dramatic increase in not just health insurance, but property insurance, um, all of it um, across the board. And it was something that's not unique to us. Um, although certainly our, our risk profile um, impacts that or uniquely impacts that, but the amount of dramatic insurance increases that the industry is seeing, and I um, included that in a recent snapshot report to you as well, is really dramatic and um, um, and something that we're going to really have to keep our eye on. Uh, planning and infrastructure development, you're, there's going to be no action items, but some really good reporting on the work that's being done um, right now, both on the master plan, transit plan and on the COA TDP. Um, and then executive governance, we're going to talk to you about passenger appreciation month and an agenda and legislative management uh, software renewal pending quote. So those are all the items that will be in other committees for action. Thank you, ma'am. That's uh, that's a lot of information. I know, but it's actually, uh, it's everything that we've been asking for, and I, I appreciate those updates. Uh, uh, if it's, got, go ahead, we sir. Got, we got one more on the last page division updates. On okay. The last slide, yeah. Just to give you all update of what's going on in our division. Right. Okay. Yeah. So um, the CDL, as we talked about. We have rich or came, came to a date that we think will be possible to start kickstart this program. June 26, if all goes well, uh, we are in the process of hiring a training coordinator 
um, probably next week. Um, we have a few folks scheduled for an interview. If we're able to hire that, then we will, um, and then if the board approved it, then we will tell the public that on June 26th will be when we want to kickstart the program. So people can apply, go through the interview process, and then see um, the class size. So just to let you know, it's a day that we all have to look out for. Probably the June 26th, if all goes well. Um, Dr. Manny, where's the classes? Well, where will they be located? So the class will be in-house, will be in here. Uh, it will be done by our training manager. So it's in-house training. And my anticipation is that by the time the class is over, uh, our safety manager will then be licensed to be the, um, the tester, which is required by the FTA. If you have an in-house tester, then right after class, we can test all of them and give them a CDL to join our workforce. Thank you, sir. Oh yeah, so the training location, the site where we're gonna train them. Um, Ms. Faye, um, thank you, Ms. Faye on that. I uh, was able to get in touch with the county and the county was able to have us uh, a facility where we can, we can start the training. That is on the, on the field training. So all that is in place. The only thing that might hold us up is hiring for the training coordinator. Um, we need that training coordinator position filled ASAP because if we have a class size of 10 or more, then some, somebody have to help the training manager, Mr. Swinton, to conduct those training classes. So I'm hoping that from now to June 26, we might have hired somebody for the training coordinator to help out. That will be the only hold up. And of course, the board approval. So <laughs> if the board approves it and we get a coordinator on, then June 26 will be the official day to start a class. Uh, yeah, I know earlier you said we would do a, uh, give, I guess, either a press release or we'll send out information to the public uh, for uh, individuals who may want to uh, join the program. Is there a different type of criteria or who might not be uh, in that criteria to to be a good eligible candidate for the program? So the requirement is to have um, a, a standard or normal driver's license and have a, a permit. So the permit, we will advertise all this through our communication and on our website, uh, what is required to be a candidate. So you must take a written test um, to get a permit. So you come in with a permit and then, which is very easy, you just go, I think is. 20 something dollars, I forget the fee here in the, in the state of Georgia. And then you take the written test. Once you pass the written test, you have a permit. And that's what we require you to come in with a permit. So we can train you on how to drive the bus. So uh, my that, question, uh, I'm sorry, sir. My second part of my question is, uh, per uh, our human resources, is there a uh, requirement for the applicants? I know some people who uh, may uh, sign up for the program who may be uh, convicted felons or just coming back from uh, from a, a prison sentence and they may want to join the program. Okay, so it's we're going to go through normal hiring like like every um, candidate that comes through CAT. You must have a clean driver's license, um, good background, um, also MVR. The MVR is pretty much your driving record and if it's anything up to three points, it's okay. Anything more than three points, then you can't join the program. So all that will be um, advertised and uh, what I call aggressive campaign. We will be reaching out to every, every entity, schools and churches and anywhere we can advertise to let people know that you can come in and we can help you get a CDL. Uh, it, it's a very big deal because um, schools charge $8,000 and and sometimes you know it takes even longer depending on who's teaching you so we have all professionals here um, to teach the class and so i think my anticipation is that the public will uh, will buy in it depends on who hears about it and i ask the board members also to help us out campaign and bring relatives in um high school is not any degree required just have a driver's license uh, pass the written test, have a clean MVR, and um, clean a background check, and, and that's all we need. And it's eight weeks training. 
and after eight weeks you have a CDL and you have to stay with us for one year. Okay. Are we good on that? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So I'll move on to the next um, point. So the 10 power transit vehicles that we've been talking about, they're all here. We have all the 10 vehicles on site. If you want to take a look, um, we got our car signs on. I, I went over there yesterday, took a picture and uh, uh, shared it with Ms. Fay. I'm so proud that at least that goal is achieved. The next thing we're waiting on is the Georgia power um, charging stations. Once that is done, we will tear the board. That's when we're going to roll these vehicles out to revenue line. But the good news is that all the vehicles are here and um, waiting on the charging station and ready to go. In addition to that, the next slide, um, we have three diesel vehicles, buses that came in. Um, if not today, tomorrow we're going to have all the 13 vehicles registered. We got all insurance, all the documents ready and we're gonna go register them to have plate and uh, make sure they're also ready to go on revenue line. We'll keep the board and the committee updated on everything that's going on with this 10 um, electric vehicles and three diesel buses for fixed rock. Other minute. Yes, sir. On the diesel, are they any different from the diesels in the past? Have there been any improvement on them? Yeah, yeah, so um, there was an EPA um, uh, requirement compliance that so the manufacturers are now is better than before there's no smoking like it used to be here um so eventually like i said either we go hybrid and all uh, electric vehicles um with environment that we all care about so but now uh, we got three brand new diesel that are better in terms of emission than the old way that they were manufacturing um, also, um, if you all come to our site here at Car Central, we have one elevator that goes up and down to the second floor. And I hope everybody have used that. That elevator was out of inspection. We got it all that done. It's inspected and it's valid for next year. So I just want the board and committee to know that our elevator is safe and uh, can take you up and down and it's good till next year inspected. Next thing on my item is the uh, fixed route buses. Now, um, I talked to Ms. Fay and with her good leadership, uh, we're all on board on this. So it takes every two years or more to order a vehicle. So if we have to order some buses, we're not getting them till uh, 2025, which is a long time. So my idea is that we selected 25, 2018 buses they're all over age, they're over useful life. And so what we call refurbishment. Refurbishment means we're gonna buy new engines, new transmission, new suspension. We're taking the whole bus out and build it from ground. It's half the price and that can be done a month or two. It's gonna, I mean, you can't even tell that with a new bus. Everything is gonna be brand new. And so that is where we wanna go now because we cannot rely on these uh, vehicles break down, cost is so much. So this would be a good idea. Most companies are doing it. So I'll share that with Ms. Faye. And um, Ms. Faye, you wanna add anything on the refurbishment? Okay. So we selected 25 of the 2018 and we wanna bring them up to life brand new. If we do that, we can go, it will take us up to six, seven years more. And, and it's just better than sitting and trying to buy new buses. Um, takes too long to manufacture them. And so, Dr. Maney, there is one thing I'll add, and it really didn't have to do with the refurbishment, but I, I do want to point out to the board that, um, so one of the things that you're going to be hearing us talk about both coming up and through the budget process is, um, you know, we know we've got the ferry maintenance facility that'll be going in over in Hutchison Island. We've got the paratransit maintenance facility that's going to be coming online. And we are, as we sit today, um, if we were fully staffed, we'd be 27 offices short or 27 spaces short in this building to be able to put folks to be able to work. Um, and parking is an interesting challenge, both here and at the ITC. So just know that as we're talking about buses and we're trying to grow our service, so we're bringing in new vehicles and new 
new services that also have new vehicles like micro transit and so forth. Just in the back of your mind, know that you're going to be starting to see some recommendations around what we've got to do to preserve our space needs for the future of CAT, um, both in terms of you know property and office space and all those kinds of things, which also relates to our ongoing negotiations around the ITC and Greyhound and so forth. So just um, I just want to put that in your mind to be thinking about that um, this is great how we're growing, um, and it is great that I know that that's going to begin to be reflected in our ridership and then expansion of our services, not just new services, but expanded service hours and expanded service frequency. That's really how we're going to grow our service. And so, but it, it's going to mean that we're going to have space and facility needs that we currently cannot meet. Um, and we'll be bringing forward um, recommendations and suggestions that we'll work together, board and staff, on how to accomplish that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fay. Um, so, uh, next point is operation division um, structure. So what I intend to do, and I share that proposal uh, with Ms. Fay, currently we have power transit and fixed route all in one room as a control room. And when they get clients or people call, they're talking over each other. Productivity and work performance is really, it's not, it's not enhanced. So what I've done, or what I've proposed, is to separate um, power transit from fixed route. And we have a location, a room that was a locker room. We clean it all up, and that's gonna be Paratransit Command Center. So if anybody call for Paratransit, it's gonna to go to Paratransit Command Center. And this way, we are more efficient, more effective. And um, the, the fixed route will also have their control room, which is current, and it's gonna be only fixed route. So this will help us and our customers um, will be happy about what we're bringing up. Also in that restructuring, we're gonna have supervisor be at zones. So for example, the ITC, we're gonna have a supervisor that's gonna be there at all time. Currently, we don't have any supervisor station at the ITC. Drivers get to the ITC, they can leave whenever they want. But if you have a supervisor there, they'll make sure that they live on time. When I was driving the bus at Mada, you cannot even go for it. Once you get there, there's a supervisor chasing you out. You gotta go because we want you to live on time. So the customers go also, uh, um, enjoy the, the time that we say we're going to be there to pick them up. It all help enhance on time performance uh, and also secure our facility, our hub facilities. And um, if we do that control center, the call uh, currently, every call goes through the call center. When we separate these two, every paratransit call is going to go to the paratransit command center. And this way, it free other people to call the call center for other stuff. And um, I've sent a proposal to Ms. Frey, and um, I'll let the board know on what direction we're going to go with that. Uh, the last uh, but one on the item is cross training. So currently, uh, and I did talk to John Allen, who's in charge for the Marine. So currently, if, if the Marine service breaks down, and uh, we have to run a bus break, so I'm, I'm planning that we have all the captains of the ferry to be cross-trained to have a CDL. So in the event that the boat and the ferry breaks down, the captain will come and take a bus out and do the bus bridge. And so this will free us up using our short drivers. We'll run down with down 40 plus drivers. So the captains will help us out also doing the cross bridge. Um, and we'll keep you updated on this proposal when Ms. Fray looked at it and approved it. The last thing that I'm proud and happy to share is we, we were trying to find a way to get relief vehicles for the drivers. So what, this is how it works. We have drivers coming in on, on the AM side and then drivers coming on the PM side. Of course, they all have to park their vehicle here and get to the ITC. They don't have any means. They used to rely on the 28. And most of the time, if it's late, the driver is gonna be late. So I went out last week shopping around to find out if I can find some means or vehicle that we can clean up. And thank God we had two minivans that were just put aside. Yeah. yeah. So I was like, what's wrong with them? Well, they won't start. As, as we find out, 
they needed all the barriers. We bought brand new barriers, we put on them, we cleaned them all up, and I, uh, we're going to give that to the fixed route uh, drivers as a relief vehicles. They can sit up to five passengers, and there's going to be two of them. So that, that's a very good news. It saves us money from buying a new vehicle for that purpose. So um, on that note, that's the end of my presentation. That was a good observation. Yes. Good observation. Thank you. Any questions? No questions, uh, Dr. Manny. I really appreciate your presentation. Uh, if there's any questions from anyone else, any board members, anybody in the gallery, just uh, now's the time before we adjourn. But uh, I wanna thank everybody for, uh, for attending the meeting and I, to give you guys an update. I think we're doing a wonderful job. I just uh, went to New York in the past two weeks and I had an opportunity to look at their transit system, even though they're a larger city and they have a lot more components, we're doing a wonderful job as a as a as an organization here in the city of Savannah because we move a lot of people, uh, we have a lot of contingency plans, and we are already looking and thinking forward. So good job to our leadership and to our board members for uh, for the forethought and thinking of others before we think of ourselves. If there's not anything else, uh, this meeting is adjourned. I think our next meeting is coming up. Chair Leggett, I'm sorry, you went on mute. And Director Odell responded in the chat that he did not have any questions. Say this. I, didn't want to, I didn't want to say this in public, but uh, we were talking about parking spaces earlier.